Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Brenna Marsichuk. I'm the Communications and Outreach Director at Madison Audubon, and I want to thank you for joining us tonight for a great presentation by Chitty Page. I'm going to give just a quick introduction to Madison Audubon for those of you who are new to our community. We are a local nonprofit that is working with members like you to protect birds and nature in this area of Wisconsin. We do that through land restoration. Uh, we own and manage around 2000 acres that are free and open for anyone to visit any time of the year. Uh, we do this also through citizen science work and advocacy through adult and youth education programming and these evenings with Audubon programs are usually held in person. But of course you are joining us for the online remix and we're grateful to have you here tonight, we are delighted to host Chitty page to talk about bringing the next generation of birders into the flock. Chitty is an educator of 18 years who worked at Columbia University and Newark Museum, working with kids of all ages on science, technology, engineering, and math. Chitty's also the inventor of the game Birdwiser and is a game-based learning consultant now. And I'll put the links to her website, uh, her couple of websites into the comments at the end of her presentation tonight. Um, tonight, Chitty will share some great insight about how we can connect with young people to bring them into the birding world and engage them more in conservation. Uh, really quick before I hand it over to Chitty, just a quick note about how we'll do this tonight. Uh, Chitty will give her presentation for about 40 minutes or so. And if you have any questions along the way, you can type them into the comments box. She'll also have a couple of times where she'll be asking questions and when that happens, I'll feed her your uh, your responses, as well as at the end, I'll feed her your questions and we'll get her insight right away. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it over and Chitty, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you so much for having me and thanks for all that awesome introduction. <laughs> uh, hi everyone, welcome and thanks for joining us today. Um, and like Brenna mentioned, um, I'll be talking a little bit about um, how to engage younger generation in birding and nature appreciation. Um, but first, I'd like to just acknowledge um, Madison Audubon for their efforts, uh, especially in youth and community engagement. Um, this is an initiative that is dear, dear to my heart, and I hope that at the end of this presentation that you would pick up a few new tools you can use to join in this effort to build the next generation of birders and nature enthusiasts. So um, I will be sharing a little bit about my journey and how um, I became involved in STEM education and game-based learning. And um, we will explore some strategies that I've used in the past to engage over 130 high school students in birding. And uh, I also take, we'll also take a look at some attributes that are unique to their generations and, and see how we can tap into some of those and create innovative ways that uh, we can engage them in birding. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, generations X, Z, and Alpha. Um, everybody hates the names of your generation. Um, I'm Generation X, actually, and I hate that too. But just a disclaimer, um, I am not an expert in, any, uh, in all things Generation Next. Um, so, um, Keeping that in mind, some of the attributes that I will mention are made from observing the members of these generations in the US, Canada, and Europe. And some of these attributes obviously differ across individuals, even in these countries. Um, and they may not even apply to um, others in different parts of the world. So that said, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what their unique attributes are. Um, generation Y um, 
also known as millennials, are born between 1981 through 1996. Generation X, uh, Generation Z, uh, also known as Zoomers, again, I hate these names, but <laughs> um, they are born between 1997 and 2012 or 2015, depending on who you ask. Generation Alpha, um, also known as the AI generation, um, AI stands for artificial intelligence. And um, they are born between 2013 through 2025. So they're the youngest generation. My daughter actually is a member of this generation. So let's take a look at some of the attributes that are unique to these generations. Um, generation Y um, members are, a lot of them are parents or um, around that age to be parents. So they're obviously very um, family oriented. They, they you know, love to spend time with family. So work-life balance is of utmost importance to them. And um, Generation Z, are they are really quick to research issues, particularly because, of course, they have the digital devices. You just Google anything and just research them. They love, love, love trends. And they are uh, very passionate about things like social justice and climate change. And they also have this desire to just create meaning or cause change. Generation Alpha, we don't know a lot about them because the youngest is about, <laughs> the oldest is about seven years old. Uh, my daughter is four, so she's in there somewhere. Um, they are active learners. Um, they learn by doing and they're not afraid of touching buttons and they're the most technologically infused generation. Um, and not a lot is known about them yet um, for obvious reasons, but it's been predicted that they will be the most comfortable to coexist with uh, artificial intelligence. Now, some of the common attributes across these, generation, um, these generations include the fact that they are digital natives, which means they, they, they cannot imagine lives without information technology and digital devices. Um, they are also gamers. Um, so they engage in a lot of digital games um, or even analog games and tabletop games are very popular across the board. They're open-minded, they're active learners, um, and they love personalized experiences. And later in the presentation, I would, um, I would share um, some of these, how some of these attributes um, could, be, could play a role in how to engage them in birding. But before I get into all that, I'd like to know a bit about your journey, um, how you got into birding, and um, we start off with how old you were uh, when you got into birding. So if you could put in your resp responses A, B through, through E in the chat. So option A is you got into birding as a child. Option B is you were a teenager. Option C, you got into birding as an early adult or as a middle-aged um, adult or as an older adult. So just quickly in the chat, um, just putting a, option A, B, C, D, or E. And this is just the scientist to me curious to know um, what, who's in the room and what the experiences are. Go ahead and put that in the chat. And then um, I have a second question for you. And so my second question is, how did you get into birding? And there are four options, one, two, three, and four. Option one being you got into birding through work or school or any place of learning in any place that you didn't have a choice, but you kind of expected to do that. And um, option number two, through a family member. Option number three, through a friend. And option number four, any other options that I may have missed. So just take some time, put that in the chat as well. Um, one through four. And I'm just curious to see what the popular responses are 
And I'll ask Brenna to help me to um, navigate through that. Okay. <clears throat> so while your responses are being tallied, um, let me just tell you a bit about myself to give you a, just a better sense of the unique uh, perspective that I uh, apply through my experience, uh, my 18 years experience in science education. So I grew up in a small town in um, Eastern Nigeria. This photo that you see is actually taken not too far away from where my parents currently live. And I have to say that I appreciate the hands-on method of science learning here in the US, um, particularly when compared to my experience um, back in Nigeria. Although um, I like science, I love science as a kid, um, and I really enjoy exploring the outdoors, science classes were miserable for me, <clears throat> excuse me, while I was in, high, in middle and high school. And this was because it was 99% teacher focused and textbook driven. So while a, a typical dissection class looks something like the image on the left um, here in the United States, the, the image on the right was my reality. A dissection class was looking at uh, an image, uh, an image on the textbook and just drawing it and trying to learn that way. And as a kinesthetic learner, um, this method of learning science was just really, really hard for me. And this is why I'm very passionate about hands-on science and game-based learning, which had, uh, which led me to creating a couple of educational games that address that. So um, I'm going to check on the polls and, the, and see your responses, uh, yeah. Brenna. So, so for the first question, how old were you when you started birding? Most of the responses were either A, 0 to 15, or C, 18 to 24 years old. And one person said that she hasn't started yet, but she's interested. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> Then for your second question about how did you get into birding, um, it was a three-way tie between school or work, family or other. Wow, oh, those are super interesting <laughs> responses. <laughs> I'm actually taking it back uh, with the, the, the first question. A lot of people got in between um, birth and 15 years old. That's amazing. So thank you all for sharing that. I, I really appreciate your participation. Now, for me, I, I heard about birding during my uh, junior year in college uh, as a zoology major in Nigeria. And uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Jane was her name. She was in her senior year and she was doing her thesis in ornithology. And she talked about her work with passion and described some of the birds that she has seen. And she spoke about it with a spark in her eyes that was, to me at the time, a bit weird. <laughs> and and now that I, now it makes sense to me because um, I, I've been on the other side um, when someone thought me weird as I talked about birding with such passion. So, but but looking back now, I think my reaction to her excitement had a lot to do with my personal experience and to demonstrate that a little bit i'm going to ask you to indulge me in a quick exercise um, that i've used a lot in in teacher trainings so i um, need to ask you to take a moment and close your eyes and think of a dog any any type of dog Okay, and now you can open your eyes and in the chat, uh, put in what type of bird you thought about and why. Brennan, do you have any responses that you can share? Not yet. Did you say type in which bird or which dog? Which dog, my which apologies. Dog. Okay. Yeah, which dog did you think about and why?
I don't see any responses coming in. So there, there okay. is a bit of a delay, but so usually, usually, um, usually when I've done this in the past with teacher trainings, the whatever dog that um, people think about um, is pulled from their experience somewhere in their past, whether it's positive or negative. And so, so you would understand why, as Jane described, what well may be this beautiful European bee eater. Uh, the image I saw in my head was a rock dove. And I want to add that Jane's study um, was done at a, the Lickey uh, Conservation Center. And this spot was one of my favorite. Whenever I visit Lagos, Nigeria, I would go to this spot every chance I get. And so I was already into nature. I've, I'm literally in the same space, but I didn't see what she saw. And um, while this, you know, while it may seem obvious, but my conversation with, with Jane did not highlight any of my interests. And and you know, if, if she had invited me for a hike down um the ravine on campus with her binoculars i i would assure you i would have started birding way sooner but this is and and this is particularly why a large um number of young people um may not be interested in birding and there is a um every five years you, the u.s fish and wildlife service conducts a national survey about um, you were the, about people that are engaged in wildlife related activities. And I just want to, so I just want to highlight the, the results based on wildlife watchers from that survey. And just to point out, 92% um, of wildlife watchers in this study are birders. But I want to note that while 92% are birders, um, in this survey, those 92 may also be engaged in more than one wildlife watching uh, activity. So uh, someone that says they are birder, uh, birders could be also to also watch mammals or reptiles or um, any other of, of these categories. So in this survey, different age ranges were interviewed, but I'm going to just focus a bit on the 16 to 70 year old population and nobody in, I don't know if a lot of people um, in that response from the, the poll didn't, 17 and 16 year olds were not popular. Um, and even in this data that I'm about to show you, it wasn't either. Um, so this graph shows a percentage of all the 16 and 17 year olds interviewed who are wild, wildlife watchers. And this is between 1996 and 2016. So in 1996, 18% of the 16 and 17 year old populations, population was, uh, there were, were wildlife watchers. And in 2001, that percentage dropped to 3%. And in 2006, it was uh, about 3% and it dropped a little bit in 2011. So now I want you to in, in see, guess and see if you can guess how, what, that's, what this percentage is um, for 2016. Any guesses? So anyone? Not yet. All right. If you guessed 3%, um, you're right. It's still between, it went up a little bit, but it's still quite low compared to 1996. And so um, is, this is a 83% like, a drop in the percentage of 16 and 17 year olds that engaged in wildlife watching. And in 2000, the next survey comes out in 2021, and we're just hoping that, I'm hoping that it will go up a bit. Um, so fingers crossed. But as I, as I researched why we have this drastic drop between 1996 and 2001, um, I just 
keep thinking, what could have changed during those periods? And I, as I dig more deeper, I found that video games boomed during this period. Um, PlayStation hit c consumers in 1994, Nintendo followed suit in 1997. And with each passing year, these video games become more, um, uh, get just get better and better, especially in terms of graphics. And they get, they're more and more inexpensive. So more homes can afford to um, have one. And how can you compete with this? Uh, or better yet, how can, you, how can we utilize it somehow to engage a generation that has become so tech dependent? And later on, I would I'll share a little bit about how I use technology to engage um, teens to birds. And speaking of which, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the teens I worked with. Uh, I got um, a position as a youth program coordinator at the Newark, now Newark Museum of Art in Newark, New Jersey. And this program was called the Explorers Program, um, and it's it's a, a career preparedness program for high school students. And um, the Explorers Program hosts about 40 high school students um, from around New Jersey, and these students are engaged in STEAM curriculum. And if you're not familiar, I know a lot of people are familiar with STEM. A STEAM uh, is a, an acronym that stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, the Arts, and Math. And in this STEAM curriculum, uh, birding was used as a tool to teach science process skills. And these are skills such as observation, identification, making inference, um, making predictions, and uh, communicating results. And every year, a new group of students join the, the program and become the birding team. And um, the birding team is called Brick City Nighthawks. And uh, the Nighthawks uh, compete in this 24-hour um, World Series of Birding competition in Cape May, New Jersey. And the students are engaged in weekly birding workshops to kind of get them ready for this competition. Um, and what is worth noting is that the students are in this program are members of Generation Y and Z. So I'm going to share some of the lessons learned from my experience working with explorers. Um, and I'll highlight some challenges as well that I come across as I engage them in birding and some ways that I tackled some of these challenges. So the first one, which is an obvious one, is competing with the technology. I mean, these days kids are no longer uh, bored enough to just go outdoors and seek for engagement and entertainment. Um, and even now, social activities have extended to digital formats. You know, we have Facebook and Snapchat and TikTok and who knows what comes after that. Um, but what I did with Explorers was I, incorporated technology that was available at the time. In late January or early February during the burning, um, the burning season, um, there is barely, you know, when there is barely any avian uh, activity outside, I would use a, bur a burning software and we would do burning indoors. And using this burning software, explorers learned to identify the birds, uh, dif different bird species in your natural environment on the computer. And uh, the, the software also generates uh, an array of bird identification challenges, which gives them, gives them points at the end of the challenge. So naturally, other students would compete among each other to see who gets the highest points. And, um, and it was just, it just gamified, they gamified it on their own, just competing among themselves. And then another challenge that I, come across, I came across as I worked with explorers um, was inclusivity. For the explorers, they rarely saw a young person burning, uh, at least not in Newark. And um, for years, they did not see any person of color their age um, doing any birding activity. Um, and even when we go out bird, uh, scouting, 
um, they, they rarely see these things and even during the burning competition. So when one, when this concern came up with one of my students um, at a meeting, I, I used a bit of reverse technology to tackle this issue. So I, I said to them, what if you become that other person showing other kids that it, it can be fun? How about if you guys organized and planned a burning festival for the community and I can get the museum support and, and even staff to volunteer and work the event? And that's how Skies Alive Family Fun Day uh, fledged. So each year, um, the team, the, the burning team wraps up their burning season by planning and implementing this annual burning festival for kids and families from the Newark community. And this event was such a success, it would bring in about 1,200 participants each, if, each year um, and was about total of 4,800 uh, 4, people throughout the course of the four years that we ran the festival. And also implementing this event also, you know, it meets the teenage, uh, teenagers, a typical teenagers need to be heard, included, accepted, and, and have that sense of ownership, right? And this also meets a Zoomer's motivation to contribute to the community. Another challenge that posted that I came across um, was just the, the burning hobby expectation. Um, so the instant expectation and pressure to remember the names, the birds and the names of the birds and their identification marks. And this can take away from the experience, particularly from a, a new birder. Um, and also this speaks more to exclusivity than inclusivity. And, and really nobody, need, nobody wants to feel like an outsider or a newbie. So in my students' case, knowing the names um, of the birds and their identification marks was an end goal because the uh, for learning purposes. But if, if knowing the names of the birds and your identification marks are not necessary for your audience, then to, I wouldn't worry so much about that. Um, just the focus on making it about the experience of just enjoying the beautiful diversity of birds and nature. One of my favorite challenges was the, the fun factor. Um, the first impression my students get about birding is, oh, it's not fun, it's, this is boring. And what's interesting is that the same students who thought it was not, it was boring, um, were the same students that stayed out in pouring rain, soaked to the skin, looking for a common yellow throat that almost eluded us one year during the, the competition near Cape May. Now, how did we get, how did we go from, ugh, it's not fun to this? How did teenagers who initially tiptoed around muddy trails because they didn't want to get their sneakers dirty, how do they engage, emerge to, be, to, to teens who walked around in soaking wet sneakers, burning? And I'll tell you how, fun and games. Like most members of their generation, they loved to socialize, they loved games. So I started looking for games that I could use to engage them in bird identification. And as I looked, I just, I found nothing, not, nothing that speaks to bird identification. So I created a couple. The first game I um, worked on was um, a modification of a game called Guess Who? If you're not familiar with this game, um, and while playing this game, each player has a, a card with a name and a face on it. The objective of the game is to be the first person to guess the, the face on your opponent's card. And I think another game that has similar objectives as um, Mastermind. 
So this is our bird version of guess who? We called it which is it because it sounds like the call of a very inquisitive bird that goes which is it? Which is it? Which is it? Um, as you can see, it was uh, it has birds instead of faces, um, and just like guess who? The objective of this game is to be the first to guess who, or in this case, what bird your opponent has. And to do this, you ask yes or no questions like, does your bird have a crest? Does, uh, does it have eye rings? Does it have a blue head? And as they gather these clues, they eliminated the wrong birds until the last bird standing is most likely the bird, the, the opponent's bird. So here they have fun, they're learning about bird identification. The game was a hit. And so I continued and I got another game um, that we called Who's Call? And this particular game focuses on teaching bird calls. And so for this one, um, each student puts together a mat that is made up of um, grids with bird images, just like the one on the screen. And the student stands in the center where you have a little guy popping up. And so, and then I'll play a PowerPoint presentation with images of the birds alongside their calls while pointing out the mnemonic candles of those calls. And I'd run through this a few times and turn off the images and just um, play the songs. And each time a song is played, the, the students would try to step onto the grid that has the bird that made that call. So that way they were learning bird calls and they were moving around and engaging that physical movement um, helps them retain um, concepts that's learned. I also played Jeopardy with them and this particular, uh, we use this to just focus on the whole content that they've learned throughout the birding syllabus. And here I'm going to um, ask one question. And if anybody gets that right, you're going to get a free Birdwiser bird identification card game. So you guys, if you guys are ready, um, this is a free game, a stake here. So I'm going to go for Bye Bye Birdie 500. And so the question is, only 100 years ago, flocks of these birds were common. Overhunting drove them to extinction. If you know the answer, you just put it in the chat. The first person to get it right, if any, um, will get a free Birdwiser bird identification card game. She's going to give a few minutes, few seconds, and see if there are any responses. Are there any, Brenna? One has come in, but there is a delay, so we may want a couple coming in now. Okay. Do you want to wait for a bit to? Yeah, I'll give for it a few more seconds. Yeah, I'll give it a couple of seconds. Okay, we have some responses. Do you want me to to list them, or do you want to give the answer? I'm going to give the answer and then the first person that got that answer right, um, just um, exchange emails so that we can get the Birdwiser card to them. All right, here goes. If you answered a passenger pigeon, you are absolutely right. Do we have any <laughs> right answers? We do. Do you require that they put the what is the passenger, like make it a question? Because that would be tricky. Um, no. <laughs> okay. Kathy Gerhardt was the first to answer that. So Kathy, I will message you to make sure we have your email and we can hook you up with your game. Is there another person that said, what is the passenger pigeon? Nope. Okay. Nope. The, the Jeopardy okay. rules are off tonight. <laughs> this is, that's perfectly fine. Congratulations, Kathy. I hope you enjoy the card game. So, um, so other things that I did to just introduce more fun factor um, into the birding experience for my students was sleepovers. So um, for the competition, the students start 
we started we started the competition around 5 a.m. and that's quite early um, and it's particularly it's a bit hard for our students to get to the museum at that hour by public transportation. So what I did was um, in the evening before the competition, I actually I organized a sleepover. So the students will start arriving around 4 p.m. And, you know, they arrive all packed and ready for the competition the next day. And so during this event, we'll play, you know, we'll play some bird games that I mentioned and we'll end with a movie and popcorn. And usually I'd play the movie Big, The Big Year. And if you've not seen that movie, I, I really recommend it. It's super fun. Um, and this event just helps them bond more as a team and also offers an opportunity for the students to just meet that need for socializing and also getting them quite hyped up for the competition. So the idea here is to eliminate as many obstacles as possible to make it easier to engage people who might not otherwise be interested in burning. Um, these strategies that I've used um, and that I've shared here might have been geared towards teenagers, but the same processes can be applied in most circumstances, as long as you customize it to meet your target audience interests. So let's take some action here. Let's think about one person in your life that you'd like to engage in and, and connect with and um, just engage with them in birding or some form of birding activity and just commit by putting their name in the chat. And then just think about what they like and how you can incorporate their interests into birding. Some examples I can share with you. Um, I know a lot of Generation Y and Z members are gamers, they love digital and tabletop games. And there are some games out there that are um, particularly, especially tabletop games that might be useful in engaging them in birding and wildlife appreciation. Uh, one popular game, some of you may already have heard of it, is Wingspan. And, and in this game, players try to attract a variety of birds by collecting food and other resources to create a healthy habitat for their birds in this game. Another bird related game is Birdwiser, which um, I designed and it was inspired by actually a popular game that I played in Nigeria as a child and it's called, the, that game was called What? A similar game here in the US is Uno. And just like Uno, the objective here is to discard all your cards by matching bird identification marks. So you're matching um, blue head to blue head or crest to crest or neck ring to neck ring. And, and that way you're just discarding your cards and being the first to get rid of all your cards. But there are also some action cards, some negative action cards that highlight some challenges that birds might face, such as landing in oil spills or crashing to the tall buildings or habitat loss. Um, and there are also some positive action cards that counteract these negative ones, you know, such as we landed in oil, um, nature reserves, there's plenty of food to eat and so on. Um, Birdwiser Flight Path is another game that I designed and it's a, uh, a board game about a bird migration and here the players take on the role of uh, the last flock of an endangered or threatened species migrating south. Um, so migrating from uh, North America through to South America. And um, similarly, they face challenges along the way. They could land in oil spills or land in a land of plenty. And each of these um, aspects determine how they move across the board. Um, this game is still in development and we hope to launch a Kickstarter campaign sometime in spring um, next year. And the card game, the Birdwise card game that I talked about initially is actually uh, currently sold out and we are hashing out the, some logistics to run another print for it. And all that information will be in our website. And if you're interested in just getting more information, you can sign up at our website for updates. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, excuse me. 
there are other games that are not uh, bird related, but just speak to general wildlife conservation that, that's out there. And they are all well made and um, fun games that you can engage your, young, your loved ones in. Now, um, I mentioned earlier the generation Y and Z also like um, personalized experiences. So let them explore in their own ways. If they like arts, um, you can get them a color by number kit. There are kits out there that has a whole image. If you see the, it, the picture of um, Eastern Bluebirds, th that is an actual paint by number kit and you color it and a lot of them come already framed and some of them come with framing kits. So you color it over um, a conversation across the table or grab, grab uh, grab a glass of wine and just paint this image together and put it up on the wall. They also have like digital versions of it where you can upload um, images um, and share them and color them. Um, and Generation Alpha, um, they're really very young um, right now and that's my daughter's generation, like I mentioned. So they're naturally curious and observant. So this is the time to really get them. It, a lot of people in that poll that we had um, mentioned that they started between um, birth and 15 years of age. That's a great time to get them into birding and into nature. Um, to get them a kid's binoculars or even a, get a bird feeder that would just bring the, their attention to different variety of birds. Um, there are also coloring books out there. I know Audubon had one a long time ago. I don't know if they're still in print, but on the Birdwiser website, there I have a free downloadable um, coloring book to just um, engage little young ones, especially now with the pandemic. I know a lot of parents are um, homeschooling or helping do their kids through school. And just to touch base on inclusivity, um, a lot of millennials are parents and, and they are family oriented, like I mentioned, but it's hard for parents to go on a guided board, uh, bird walk, especially if they have toddlers. And this is a, 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 a struggle that I personally have with my four-year-old daughter. So for an audience like this, um, consider making it a family friendly, friendly outing, um, encourage them to bring their kids and I don't know, go out for ice creams afterwards and just include, include everyone and think about everyone and what their interests are. And if your loved ones love technology, throw in a cell phone adapter. <clears throat> Um, Snap Zoom has one, and I just want to put a disclaimer out here. Uh, I'm not affiliated with any of these products, but I'm just trying to offer some tools and uh, you know what's out there that you can use and engage your young ones and, and people in your lives in nature appreciation. So um, I think this particular product here, I think Bre uh, Brenna is going to put an, uh, up a link. Um, is you can find them on Amazon uh, for a relatively cheap price. And this trick actually worked for my husband who loves, loves, loves Facebook and photography. So I got him taking photos of birds and just posting them on the Birdwiser website. Um, so um, another thing that you could do is just throw in some high tech if you can afford it. Um, Pentax just released uh, this awesome binocular, three in one binoculars that snaps into two. And so when you snap into two, you can share one with um, whoever you're on a walk with, or you can snap the two monoculars together to, to create one scope, one telescope, which is super awesome. Um, if I took someone out and snapped my binoculars into two, I think that I would get a super cool reaction from them and that would be totally worth it. And um, just personalize and rebrand a bit. Um, talking about rebranding, urban birding has become quite popular among millennial birders, particularly in the UK. 
Um, and this is um, backed by a couple of articles that I've seen um, mentioned that urban birding has attracted quite a number of millennials. Um, so think about if you live in an urban area and someone does not like going out in nature, nature like my students, just go birding around um, their environment with them. And make it a cool social ordeal. Um, birds and beer goes together and so does birds and wine. And Audubon, uh, Madison Audubon has uh, a program that's called Birds, Bikes and Brews. So join them in these events and so social events have become quite popular among generations X as well, as well as uh, Y and Z. And just make it personal, reach out to people you're close to, develop a personalized experience unique to them. And just remember, less emphasis on bird identification and more about connecting over a well-rounded and fun experience. And just generally, if you can, um, just advocate as much as you can for place-based learning um, and outdoor education in our schools and other places of learning. Um, and support organizations are already um, engage young people in nature and volunteer with them if you can. And if you already do so, I just want to commend you. Thank you everyone for joining in. And um, here are my contact information. Feel free to follow us on Twitter, sign up on our website for updates, and there are downloadables on our bird, uh, the BirdWiser website as well. And if you want to learn more about what I do, you can um, go to my personal web page, uh, my website, which is chidipage.com, and you know, feel free to shoot me an email or connect that way. Thank you so much. And I think Brenna may have some questions she's been collecting. Yeah, if anyone else has questions as we go, feel free to add them into the comments box. Um, while we wait for any um, other questions to come in, I'll, I'll ask one that I hear people in my life ask often, <laughs> which is like, why, why use technology as a crutch? to get kids into nature. You shouldn't, shouldn't being in nature be enough? And, and do we expect that kids would always want to be on their phones if they're in nature? Or does, do you see an evolution in how kids experience being outside where they slowly or quickly put their technology down and experience being outside just for being outside? I think it differs from, um, across individuals. Um, my, my response to that would be to just get them hooked in, what one, in one way that they're very comfortable with. Um, whether it's, if it's technology, if it's looking at the birds through their phones, get them doing that first. And hopefully as time goes on, they want to do the right thing. And before you know it, even if they're seeing the birds or nature through their phones, they're actually out there in nature as well and not doing any of those games or um, Facebook or TikTok or whatever. They're actually out in nature, but they're using the tools that feels comfortable to them and, uh, to engage nature in their own way. Um, you know, like, for example, there are uh, field guides are migrating to its apps instead, as opposed to like having this huge book and carrying it around. That's one way. If they want to take pictures of the birds, at least they're seeing the birds, even if it's through their, their screen, they are seeing the birds, they're paying attention to them. One day they will want to see it closer through the binoculars as opposed to their screen. Um, so my, my, um, strategy here is to get them out there first let them use whatever they're comfortable with first and then as curiosity you know sets in and they want to um, explore other options and then you'll be ready to help them with their binoculars and taking a closer look at the, uh, the birds through them awesome thanks um so if anyone has any other questions that um 
come up as you're watching this, maybe even after the presentation is over, feel free to type them into the comments box too. And, and we'll see if we can get those answered for you. But Chitty, thank you so much for being here tonight and sharing your expertise with all of us. Um, and thank you for all of those who tuned in and um, were really engaged during this. Um, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you everyone for tuning in. And like Brenna said, if you have any questions, just share that and I'll be happy to answer any of them. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks everyone.